but it's a little divergence of the program right now. It's a, it's a kind of digest, digestive. Um, in, the, in the kind of excitement of the morning, uh, we, we realized that uh, Josh left something out of his presentation, so he's going to do the kind of after-dinner drink version uh, for just five minutes before we um, before Fernando comes and announces the, the next presenter. So if we could bring Joshua back up to the stage, that would be great. I truly apologize. I was trying to channel Carlos Jimenez and his incredible, incredible poetic speaking, and I finished, and I just ran off stage, and I realized I didn't finish my speech or my lecture. So in conclusion... <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to, again, this is in a way more for the students, but um, we started our practice for the first seven years as primarily 95% a residential firm. And we made a decision to diversify our the program type um, as quickly and as fast as possible to not only to create keep it fresh in the studio, but also to give back to the community in a more profound way. Um, and we've been incredibly blessed with a, a wide range of projects. Um, we currently, again, we're about a 16, 17 person firm, and we have 14 projects in construction currently, and we're about to break ground on four more in the next two months. So the studio is kind of a madhouse right now, just cranking. Um, but one of the projects that's under construction will be done in a couple months is any architect's dream project. Um, it is a contemplative, um, it's kind of the Rothko Chapel of Stanford University. Um, it was an RFP that we responded to and won the commission to design a, a very small project. It's 4,000 square feet. Um, and it's, it's, the premise is that Stanford University is a hotbed of stress, both in the faculty and in the student body. And they have no non-denominational place to, um, to go to, to contemplate, to reflect. And how can this pavilion um, be a place of reflection? But it's inspired by Nathan Oliveira's paintings, uh, four, the four last remaining paintings. And so it's a combination of art, spirituality, landscape, and architecture. Um, so it, um, very briefly, it's a very organically uh, grown building. Uh, it's, it's rammed earth that you see um, that, that is um, uh, kind of f mined from the site. Um, and it has a series of indoor-outdoor um, water gardens. Um, and it will have a very womb-like interior with uh, indirect light coming in from above and then direct connection to the landscape beyond. Conversely, uh, so that would be designing for the haves, to be quite honest. Uh, people at Stanford camp campus are not suffering. Um, the inverse of that is a remarkable project that a superintendent found our firm, even though we had never designed a school in our history. Um, we won, a, won the commission to design a ground-up high school in Santa Rosa, California, for uh, a student population of about 450. 100% uh, uh, Latino farm worker children that is blowing the doors off of almost every high school in, in California. Its graduation rate is 100%. Uh, their uh, college bound rate is 95%, which is about 30 to 40% higher than the standard uh, high school in California. And it's the budget is minuscule. It'll probably be the lowest budget ground up high school in California. Um, and we're taking a very pragmatic approach where we're basically taking a simple agrarian gabled shed building, stretching it out, pulling it apart, integrating landscapes, courtyards, and light, um, and creating kind of a, a nucleus around this grand collecting uh, space in the center of, of campus. Um, so this is you know, uh, in construction documents at the moment. Um, also, in flipping back to the San Francisco, the city, um, we're transforming a 20,000 square foot historic um, brick um, turn of the century, San Francisco's first electric railway station into uh, a 
progressive media arts cultural center for um, the largest underserved youth population in San Francisco, which is in the Excelsior. Um, so it's a, a really remarkable program. Um, we're in the, both of the last project and this project were, were integ integrally involved in the fundraising for the project. So we've got a million and a half more to go on the high school and 20 million on this building. And these are occupying the attic spaces, cross-pollinating literary arts, design arts. Um, going back to the rural, uh, we've um, been commissioned to create a first phase uh, tasting room for a winery. Uh, we're transforming an existing winery into both production and tasting room. And then phase two will be a ground up winery um, in the field yonder over here. Um, but this just uh, be opened recently. And then in the city again, working with James Beard award-winning chef Corey Lee, designing a um, kind of Nouvelle French restaurant in Hayes Valley. And then lastly, a 90,000 square foot brewery for uh, 21st Amendment, which is a craft brewery that has gone to um, mass production in, in the canned venue. So this is kind of a new market uh, that's out there. And um, we're cranking away on this as well. So that's just wanted to give you some breadth of what we do as well, besides the one building. Thank you very much. end of the dinner. Uh, I'm Fernando Lara and I teach a bunch of things related to Latin America here at the school and it's my pleasure to introduce Francisco Panchi Tomboli and Sonia Carissimo. Uh, when I started looking at their work and trying to figure out what to say to introduce them, I was very intrigued by the name of their firm. Uh, if you look at our flyer, and if you look at the website, the name of the firm is a series of signs, minus equal plus x, or, or times. So minus equal plus, we are all very aware of it. Less is more. Uh, it's right there. But the times, the x, the multiplication sign that comes after it, and I was trying to think about it. And yesterday, of course, during dinner, I thought, OK, it's the English translation of that sign, which is about time, uh, the multiplication sign, times. And allow me to do a little digression here to talk about a lot of time and very little time. So in terms of a lot of time, uh, it's important to try to understand. I think we need to make an effort to understand this continent that we share, this place that we share, the Americas. And the most unique thing about this place, on top of the landscape, on top of the uh, dramatic landscapes and, and the variety and all the latitudes that it spreads north and south, is the fact that human beings entered here either 15,000 years ago through the Bering Strait or earlier. There are some theories that human beings arrived here over 20,000 years ago. But the reality is, those human beings, those societies, were completely isolated from the rest of the planet for 15,000 years. Uh, and that matters. I mean, that has something to do with us. The large majority of us, our descendants are Europeans or Africans that came here by choice or were forced to come here. And a small part of us are descendants of those people that were here developing themselves for those 15,000 years. And we don't know much about them. We, uh, we don't have much awareness of what they left us in terms of related to this landscape. But this awareness of all the places in the Americas is much higher in Paraguay. Uh, Paraguay, by the nature of isolation and their history that I, I don't have time to uh, elaborate, they uh, came up as a society with a much higher integration between the Europeans, the few Africans that came, and the, so, the local society that was there before the arrival of the Europeans. So much so that Guarani, 
is one of the official languages of Paraguay. And the large majority of the population speaks both Guarani and Spanish. So in this long time perspective, Paraguay is a very interesting representative of what this continent is about and, and, and holds part of that knowledge. Now, going from a lot of time, thousands of years, to very little time, it's amazing how young they are. They got carded out of a restaurant yesterday because they didn't have ID and the waiter didn't buy the, the, the story that they are visiting faculty members from Asuncion, Paraguay. It doesn't fly. They look 21 or barely, so they, can't, they just can't drink, uh, which is another feature of the practices uh, in, in, in South America, south of the border and mostly in South America, that young people have the chance to get fresh out of school at 21, 22, and start practicing. So uh, Punchy Tomboli has about 10 years since he graduated, uh, and Sonia even less. So it's amazing that they can compress so much work in this short time. Uh, and it's amazing that they represent Paraguay with this very long history of what makes us Americans, this encounter between the societies that were here for so long and the Europeans and Africans and Asians that came to this continent. So with that short introduction, please welcome Panchi Tomboli and Sonia Carissimo. Thank you very much, Fernando, for that introduction. Uh, very nice. And first of all, I want to thank also all the organizers from this uh, Latitude 6. Uh, we are really happy to be here in Austin, and we feel li like home. So thank you very much. And we also want to thank and, and uh, say that we're really honored to be uh, amongst these uh, great architects that are giving their their speeches too. And well, you explain a little bit the name. I'll try to uh, make it a little bit uh, profounder. Uh, as uh, the, the name of the of the studio is uh, is are these uh, equations. Uh, the first one is uh, Mies van der Rohe. Less is more, but more like um, trying to allude this. Uh, difficult simplicity that that that, uh, that that the equation says, and the other one is um, alluding more to uh, getting the best for the more for the uh, for the least. That is uh, from the Ames uh, couple. That are uh, is another posture that is very very um, strong for us. Uh, this name came first from a from a wood uh, workshop we have we still have in the in the in the studio. And then uh, the, the name became so consequent so for some things we did in the in the in the in the office, so we uh, applied the name for the office also. Well, just to show uh, where Paraguay is, Paraguay is in the in the center of South America. We are Mediterranean. We don't have any any seas, but we have a lot of uh, rivers that connect uh, the, the the country to to our neighbors. We also show this because it's uh, it's really important that we we, we always in, in in school we were taught to look up north to look up in Europe and like this uh, this drawing is really uh, great for us because it it like turns over our our, our north and our, the south is our north really this is like. Um, just to show Asuncion, uh, Asuncion is uh, by the Paraguay River. And it's a um, very low, dense uh, city. We have like 30 inhabitants per hectare. It's it's very low, um, but it's very well connected by the, by by the the river. The river was one of the main uh, connectors. Asuncion, in, in fact, was uh, they call it Madre de Ciudades. It was a where the conquerors came from Spain, and from there they reconquered other places and and and, and conquered, uh, made new new establishments. And we're gonna talk about. Uh, first of all, I wanna say I, I'm really sad that uh, Sonia Carissimo, that is 
sit in the, amongst the audience. Uh, she, she isn't up here with me because of the language uh, border, and it's a little bit of shame, but I'll try to make it. We always make the, the conference together, and it shows a little bit the, 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 how we work and how we fight and everything. So um, we're going to talk about this house, and we're going to show some concepts also from uh, uh, that we applied in other work we have done. Well, this house is a, it's a 320 meter square house. Uh, it's in a residential area in Asuncion. And uh, the first concept we're going to talk is in habitat, uh, in space. This is we start with uh, with uh, the the finished house, uh, and and we also would like to show the this uh, this kind of space where where the outside is uh, you're in the inside, but you feel like being in the outside, and it's uh, uh, something something that we try to do in, in almost all the, the the architecture we do. And uh, this relationship between the outside and the inside is uh, really important, and also the, to 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 try and manage the materials and manage this uh, this roof that is hanging from the ceiling, the the, the heaviness, but also this uh, very flooded uh, space. We have also the the all the service back in front of the of the of the house, and it's. Uh, more intimate, the kitchen, the, and here you can see in the in the in the in the model uh, this fluid space from from the uh, the, the 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 first uh, the the floor plan, and here you can see how uh, it's more intimate the the service part, and also more intimate the the sec the, the first floor where the where the bedrooms are. And this uh, here, you, you can see the architecture plans. I'm not gonna show in detail. It's just to tell that the, the, how the social part is integrated to the surroundings and how the the uh, the bedrooms are are more intimate. And this comes because it's it's not uh, just a random thing. It comes because uh, in Paraguay, as 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 uh, Fernando told before, th there's a there's a mix of cultures between the, the indigenous people and the Spanish people that came. And the indigenous people were used more to live outside and have the, their social life outside and, and have, have small uh, uh, like ref, refuge for the sleeping and for, the, for all the intimate activities. And um, when, Span when Spanish people came to South America, uh, well, this is this is in, in Paraguay, this is in Venezuela, but I think the the space is is great. This uh, thing, I mean, being inside, but really being outside, also this uh, intermediate space is really interesting. And the the interesting thing is that the the the, the Spanish came to to Paraguay. And they couldn't impose an architecture uh, to uh, like they did in other places in South America. They had to adapt to 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 local uh, typologies. So here you have this space where uh, this is a uh, an Asuncion in the early early days of Asuncion. This is a, a an intermediate place where almost all the living uh, occurs, and there's a closed place that is uh, for the bedrooms and and this um, place that you're you're inside, protected by, by the elements, but you are very integrated to the outside. That's that's the kind of space we try to 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 put on the on the on the on the, on the constructions we make. And also these uh, these uh, elements are are also um, how do you say? They uh, solve the problem of, of uh, climate, uh, like rain, uh, sun incidents, and it it makes much more comfortable in terms of, of uh, how do you say um, a thermal and, and 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 water elements. But I think in this photograph is uh, I like it very much because it 
like uh, uh, englobes all the things uh, I'm saying about uh, the, the, this intermediate space, this space that is protected by the elements, but very highly integrated to the surroundings. And this is a lemonade bar. This is a, a small bar we made that uh, tries to, to represent that kind of space. Here we made some uh, wooden pallets uh, roof. I'm going to explain later. But we have this very permeable uh, space, protected, shaded. But uh, also, you can, you can see through, and the wind passes through. And this is a, a cable that is very common in Paraguay. This kind of, of chair that you see there is a silla cable, we call it. And it's made of, of rubber bands that, uh, that are very, very, very uh, common there in Paraguay. You can see everybody in the street sitting on these kinds of, of chairs. And well, we made some panels, structural panels, uh, with uh, this um, material. And it was very permeable. And also these kinds of, of, of space. This is a covered gallery that uh, once a month there, there's a, 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 an, a, an event, dancing event from, from Menko in a, in, a, in a dancing institute. And it's like a, you're in the inside, but you really feel outside in this space. And well, this is a wooden pallet wall with a wooden pallet roof also. And in this house, for example, this is a house in Lambaré, uh, the, the same thing. We, we try to separate from the, from the borders of the house to have this uh, cross ventilation. We also try to uh, integrate the, the, in the best way to the, to, the, to the patio of the house. And uh, Always talking about these intermediate places. Uh, the, you have the outside, the intermediate place, and, and, and the inside. But and this protects you very much from the rain, from the sun inc incidents. And, and well, uh, this is another house we're uh, we're constructing right now. And uh, in, in this house, we set the the the. the it's very integrated to the surroundings, but also we set the, all the trees in the house. So it's, it's really a, 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 you have a lot of light, a lot of ventilation, and, and and well, uh, the other thing we try to manage in, 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 the, in the architecture is orientation and light management. And, I will resume all of this, uh, but here uh, we, we give very, very much importance to the orientation of the house. And well, many people in Paraguay say, no, the West is the worst orientation, but I think that it's, it's a tool to make something interesting about it. And in, in particular in this house, we created a, a, a filter uh, wall that and, and created a little uh, side uh, garden that makes like a a sponge in in means of heat and in means of uh, uh, wind uh, transitions and all of that and also uh, into the, into the to the east uh, open windows in the in the in the in the top of the of the of the structure and and create this this uh, cross ventilation also and also uh, small places where the cold, uh, where the uh, warm heat goes up like a like a like a heat chimney. Here you can see the the model and the treatment in the east facade and the and the treatment in the in the west with this filter and the the how the light comes in 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 this spot right and you have this this ventilation. Here you can see uh, how, uh, with small gestures in the structural, uh, um, when we when we uh, design the structure of, of, of the house, we, with these small gestures of separating, drilling the, uh, dripping the, the light into the, uh, to to enhance the texture of the of the bricks, and also uh, bringing light and ventilation in other places. Uh, uh, was something that was very important in, 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 in this project. 
here are the, the, the windows that you can open for the for the ventilation for the for the 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 the, uh, the heat to go off and this is uh, the the garden I was talking about that it's uh, you have this wall that is like a filter we have the the nine uh, the hollow bricks and we turn it around and, and use it as a as a as a, com a, fi a filter uh, wall and then you have all this uh, vegetation in between uh, to protect the the, the 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 glass so the, the the heat doesn't enter directly into the house you have like a uh, and this is the opening for the for the east, uh, much smaller one. Uh, we try to to use these elements not to put uh, a lot of, of beams in it. And also, uh, we try to uh, give a little uh, twist to the 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 way we we put the the. The elements in this case, the the bricks, to generate this uh, phenomenology of of light and 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 shadows, and and to to show one place. And in this case, this is a wall from the from the from the swimming pool area, and and the, the there's a small deposit filters behind it. Uh, this is a duplex house we made, and and also we we use this. Uh, Hollowed uh, brick to to uh, this facade is in the in the west orientation is where the the sun hits the most, and we use this uh, this filter to protect the the, the facade. It's separated a little bit from the from the walls, and we also uh, try to uh, bring in light in 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 this uh, uh, brick vault and. But an, an indirect one, and also this uh, this hole in the roof has uh, has uh, holes for the heat uh, the, the heat to go up, and it, it's like a a, a brick. Uh, it's constructed of brick, and it it's the the, the light uh, comes in directly. And well, in going back to Lambare House, also to to uh, see the the climatic aspects. In this house, for example, uh, this was the, the 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 line of the terrain. I remember when the the, the owner told me how many he asked me how many uh, uh, tractors were of of, of uh, soil we're gonna bring to 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 get to the level of the of the street that was this one. And I told him no. Let's take the take the 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 dirt out of here. Put it here. Put the house 50 centimeters over the the the, the zero point, and well, the result was these uh, these bedrooms that you go down there, and it's really like two or three degrees uh, less. So it's a climatic comfort, very, very a very good one. And also in the north uh, north uh, facade, uh, you uh, we we. Did a little twist also to the to the how we put the the bricks together, and we made this filter. At, at first it was a wooden one, and then uh, we convinced the client to to make it of ceramic because of uh, the the maintenance of these materials are really really very low, and uh, and also they when they when they grow old they grow old in a noble noble way. I think. This is a little bit the, the, the textures of it, and also uh, try to, uh, as the same way as, as as in the other photograph, try to make a gesture of where the house is occupying in the in the in the in the terrain, and and we we do that, giving a little texture, and also uh, as as we separate the 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 the, the openings, so glass openings from the on the border, uh, you can you can also see this phenomenology. And uh, another thing that we uh, also have in, in very very into the projects is the economy. Almost all the the, the projects have a low budget, so we have to uh, we have to think about economy. But I think this 
the materials and the cost is they are uh, linked in together. For example, in in the TC house, these are the 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 tensors. All the first floor is hanging from the from the from some tensors from a portic uh, structure, and we we try not to hide any elements of the house. I mean, uh, all the 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 bricks, all the uh, concrete, all the all the the materials you really use to construct the 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 house are are seen. We we try not to to uh, uh, esconder nothing, uh, hide nothing. So that results in a in a in a in a kind of of, uh, of an economy of materials uh, because you don't have to do uh, uh, posterior revestimiento. How do you say revestimiento? Yeah, clapping. We we use only the materials that that, that I mean in the in the obra bruta the, the, where where we have the the the, the construction uh, almost all of the details are 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 finished and here you can see the we use also this uh, this hollowed brick to make the, the 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 floors and well you see the the, the bricks the concrete and the, the the tensors and that detail we have seen uh, before this uh, this uh, it's not a beam, but it's like a, a metal that that makes the union between the 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 brick wall and the and the tensors, but that at the same time separates the elements. So you have a clear uh, lecture of, of the all, all the structural elements. So the structure is uh, indeed uh, very sincere. In, in and well, this is uh, the the house. And you can see all the, the same things we were talking about, the, all the materials, all the raw materials uh, being seen. And this tradu uh, traduces also to to have uh, not many uh, rubros. How do you say rubros? Uh, it's, it's, I mean, you have the, the, the brick wall, you have the concrete, you have the, the, the glasses. So uh, not many elements in the, in the construction. So... Not having as much elements in the construction reduces to a, to an economy of materials, and economy of materials reduces to cost also. This house is a 320 meter house, and it costs uh, 450 dollars a meter square. I know a meter square is, I know you do it in feet, but one meter by one meter. Well, and this is also a. a the relationship between the the constructors, uh, the the people that work in the in the in the in the construction place, with us is very very intense. That's because in Paraguay, uh, they pay very little for for making a, a architectural project. Normally, we construct these the houses. When it's a bigger scale, yeah, it's an, an uh, uh, it's on uh, other uh, constructors do it, but when it's a house we constructed, and also when we try to start to make these kinds of details, we 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 are. It's better if we are there and than giving it to a, another person to construct. And these are details that we leave like in blank spaces. We we draw uh, up to up to certain place uh, the 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 project, but some things uh, also the clients don't. Don't understand when you draw something like this. You can make a render or something, but it's not the real thing. So we make like this one meter square uh, test, and we take them to the construction site. We we do two or three of them, and he chooses from one of, uh, of the of the. And well, this finishes to to this. It's, uh, and also, in in, in buildings, uh, try to to uh, what we try to do is to. Set uh, the least amount of materials and 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 as as a, as a, as a finishing of the of the of the work. This is a, a, a car dealership, and also try to uh, play with the with the woods in the in the before pouring the concrete, and this is a, kind of the effect of an of the of the walls of the. 
uh, hollow uh, bricks. And this is to go a little back. This was shown uh, in the in the other latitudes by Javier Corral, and we we did uh, finish uh, the the university and started our first years working in Javier Corbalan's uh, studio, Laboratorio Arquitectura, and we, and we really want to show this because it like shows like a process of, of uh, what we have passed. And I'm going to briefly uh, explain this project. Here uh, in Paraguay, we always have um, uh, indigenous people or campesinos that come to claim uh, their lands or and I'm not gonna get into that problem but they go and they occupy these public spaces in very precarious uh, situations so it it was an ideal uh, scenario for us to to start experimenting uh, a simple material that people throw it in Paraguay that is a wooden pallet and also, it was a very uh, good experience to to uh, teach them how to construct these uh, little vaults and and take their their knowledge to their to their communities when they when they stopped uh, when they, when they went out out of the, out of the plaza. It was a very simple structure, and it started a, a an investigation. The people from Basurama from Spain also came and. And and we designed this. Uh, we call we call it the tuerca. It's like a, a, the closing of the of the of the, of the wooden pallet uh, structure. And it was made for yeah, people from the university came. They we constructed also, and it was really really good experience. And it, it was like a temporary uh, uh, equi equipment for uh, for a, a place and. In, in a very nice place, but very not not frequently used uh, uh, place besides the, the, the Puerto de Asuncion. And the fishermen came, they used it, and it was a very good experience of experimentation for, well, take the material to a higher level uh, to make a, a, a big vault of, of wooden pallets. And we made in, in the office, uh, uh, we we constructed one module for the for for one uh, uh, one house that Javier Corvalan did the Casa Umbraculo, but we we did this in our in our office and we managed to break the 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 vault and we 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 put 200 kilo, uh, kilograms per meter and it didn't actually break the wood is flexible so it deformed it, but it like much more weight than 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 what uh, with this uh, 200 kilograms per meter. And these are some, just some photographs of the, of the construction, simple, uh, simple tools, not very qualified uh, handcraftsmanship. And uh, we go back to this lemonade bar that was uh, another, uh, another project that we did uh, in the studio. Uh, where we put three pallets together and, uh, and uh, uh, put the more structure, structural height to the to the elements, and we had a, a roofing module that was very 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 good, and we did it in, in other in other projects as well, like this one. We had this wooden pallet uh, wall that sustained also the, the this roof, and this is like a Taking the material to a to to a limit or ex, or putting it in, in another way than than it was uh, really assembled to be, it's something that we consider very interesting in in architecture. And well, all the all the things we talked about the light, the the the, the space, it's all resumed to to uh, we try to have a. Uh, a spatial in intention in the architecture, and then we design a structure that solves all these problems. So, like all the the things we saw before, is solved uh, ma mainly be uh, in in this in this point. So we have here the plans. Um, as I was telling in in the in the uh, the, the light of the of the project, in doing these small separations here. Uh, uh, Doing that, the the, the the beams go the 
this part goes up, it creates a, a, a window, uh, you create a little patio here with a, with a, with a filter wall. So many things are really uh, uh, done in this point. And we have a very intense coming and going with a, with a structural, structural engineer. And, but it's a very pleasant uh, uh, conversation with him because we understand each other. We normally we uh, give him, we design the, the structure, and he uh, sees if the, calc the calculations are uh, verify the, 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 the structure that we that we uh, pass him. And it's uh, it's a very good experience. We we think that uh, having a structural uh, uh, knowledge is really important at the time to, to design uh, the house as well. This is uh, the structure when, when we, all the, the, the encofrado, we call it, I don't know how you, how you call it, all the, the form was taken out. And a, a little bit of the process of it, since we construct, it's, I want to show a, a little bit of the process we, we make for, for this uh, house that, the, that this floor was hanged from the, from the portix from the roof, uh, we have to to uh, do this one first, and and this is a very important uh, part for us because we have to see that all the the, the, the woods are in, in good in good shape, see that all the tensors are good, for, uh, they don't move. So because this this will be the 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 the, the one of the details of the house in, in this point. So it's very important for us to. To be careful of, with all of, of those details, and uh, here we are. Uh, this is the roof. These are the the, the tensors uh, that go on the on the beams. These beams were uh, post tense before the, the the concrete. And when the when the concrete comes to a to a, a resistance, we pull the the, the cables. Well, and the, the result is a little bit this. Here you can see uh, the, the, this intention uh, of, of the light coming in. The, the first floor uh, we got the concrete on is the last one to take out the form in this kind of structure. And here you can see uh, the, the, a little bit the, 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 the space that was uh, tried to... This is another uh, house, a more a less high-tech uh, form, but uh, you can also see the, the, the intention and how uh, from, from this pillar to this pillar we have uh, 20 meters and 5 meters that way and 5 meters that way, so the, the structure is in equilibrium. Uh, so uh, it, it, you really see that the, the, how less uh, 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 metals are in the, in the, in the, in the beams and, and that, that is more economic also. Here, uh, for instance, uh, the, the client had these wood uh, uh, beams. We made this double uh, eye uh, with a, with engineer. We uh, we designed this, and also in this house where the where the, the roof of the house is a is a is a ceramic roof like Ladios uh, Dientes, but a very simple one with one and a half meters of of height. But uh, just showing how the, the, the process of the, of the constructing is very important because this is uh, finally the, 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 the end of the, the this is the, the detail of the house in, in, the, in the construction. And also uh, in, the, in this uh, auto car dealership, the, 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 the building itself is a, is a structure. And live in, in this in this giant beam for and going back uh, to the function of the house and uh, trying to finish uh, the, the all the concept just uh, that the normally in the projects the shape of the of the structure is almost always the shape of the of the of the building and that it's Here you can see the the, the the portics and how this this floor is uh, uh, 
colgando. And with this, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce Rodrigo Pérez de Arce. Rodrigo studied architecture at the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile in Santiago de Chile and at the Architectural Association in London, where he also taught in the late 1970s. At that time, he was preparing his wonderful line drawings of the urban transformations uh, and urban design thesis that was published in a single issue of the UIA International Architects. In this urban design approach, Rodrigo took on the famed but fatally flawed urban constructions of such luminaries as uh, Le Corbusier's Chandigarh or James Sterling's run corn to carefully but subtly transform and improve them. He humanized these urban disasters and gave them a perspective of life beyond their current state. This approach hasn't lost any of its relevance. On the contrary, <clears throat> In a world that has uh, thankfully abandoned this exclusive tabula rasa type urban design model, Rodrigo's approach is more relevant than ever. On returning to Santiago de Chile in 1980, Rodrigo continued for some time to design speculative projects, urban design projects, before securing his first important commissions. Parallel to that, Rodrigo joined his alma mater as a professor and as an editor of the highly influential ARQ journal. The Valparaiso School with the Open City Group became known on an international level thanks to Rodrigo's monograph. And he's currently uh, editing or completing a book on Chilean architecture of the second half of the 20th century. Rodrigo possesses a critical, a critically constructive and thoughtful mind, while incisively critical as a thinker, Rodrigo prefers a quiet and engaging mode of discussion. This mode of engagement is based on the respect he has for others, uh, and for places, for things that exist on the ground and for things that are surrounding us. Rodrigo is appreciative of the social and cultural substance that surround us. It is a characteristic that has qualified him to be a member of the Chilean National Conservation Board. Rodrigo has received international awards for his buildings and public spaces. One of these is the Plaza de Armas, the main square in Santiago, Chile, for which he proposed a subtle intervention that succeeded to keep all of the mature trees and to provide an almost invisible renovation of what is Santiago de Chile's main public space. Another important and difficult project has been the addition of a new crypt to the Cathedral of Santiago de Chile, a project that we documented, Kevin Alden uh, and I documented, in the first of the O'Neill Ford Geographs, a publication which, of course, I strongly recommend to all of you. <clears throat> uh, Rodrigo Pérez de Arce is a man of letters, a man with a universal mind, a mind that is at home in the world as much as it is at home in Santiago de Chile. He is an architect in what I think is an all-embracing meaning of the word, designer, educator, and critic. And it gives me um, 
not only personal pleasure, but uh, deep satisfaction that uh, we're able to welcome one of you here amongst this conference. Thank you very much, Wilfred, uh, for the presentation. And um, like every other speaker, I want to thank publicly uh, the organizers, Wilfred, Barbara, Kevin, also the Dino School. And um, I'm very happy to, really it's been a pleasure to be here, uh, to participate of uh, the presentations before this one. Uh, the discussions that we had yesterday, the discussions I hope we'll have today, um, all very enlightening. And in some ways, my presentation is related to latitudes uh, in a fairly, perhaps, central way, in the sense that it deals with the issue of public space. Um, which one is it? It is called Plaza de Armas, Santiago, and Dan Ridan. I'll explain why and Dan Ridan. It is related to the fact that uh, we did this project. All my work has been collective work, always working with much younger teams. Um, Plaza de Armas was done in 1997 through a national competition. And recently, um, we've been called by the mayor of Santiago to take care of it again under certain circumstances which made it uh, inevitable to intervene in this space, which has been quite abandoned in the, in the time in between. Um, when Barbara invited me to, to Latitude, she says, look, I have no project going now. Um, what can I show? Um, the crypt has been published. It's, it's kind of a long way back. Uh, I've done quite a few competitions, and I'm working on a project in Santiago, which never comes to an end. But then I thought, OK, I'll present Plaza de Armas mainly to talk about the project, of course, but also to talk about circumstances around the construction of a public domain in a place like Santiago, Chile. Um, so following from yesterday's uh, discussion, I thought it was interesting to make an aside, and I made a kind of brief uh, correction to my presentation, an addenda, or something which you put before the presentation related to a question of architecture as a discipline. Um, also the subjects of precision, imprecision, technical and intellectual means. Um, we're running a studio in Santiago, where I teach. I've been teaching there for a long time, um, which is called uh, the Cangrejo a Conejo. Um, which would translate um, like from a crab to a uh, conejo, a rabbit. Uh, it is a Chilean expression. I don't understand exactly what it means, but the name interests me because it talks about the relationship between these two creatures. Um, one creature with an internal skeleton, the other one with an external skeleton. It, the studio is about how to derive something from one piece of architecture into a new form of architecture. Um, so it is about the dialogue. And it is said uh, the idea of the studio is to present the students with some kind of a canonic piece of architecture, but it must be outside Chile, not for ideological reasons. This is for methodological reasons. And uh, it must be also relatively unknown to a generation of students with we're teaching. Um, we want them to look, to have an in-depth kind of immersion into the piece of some other architect, and to be able to extract from that certain clues the program and the conditions of, the general conditions of the project, and to inscribe that on a site which is usually absolutely contradictory to the original. So it is a dialogue. Um, and insofar as it is a dialogue, it, it is about learning from a project, and it is about 
understanding the discipline as an accumulated body of knowledge and experiences is about understanding that we never work alone as architects. We work against a fantastic kind of backgrounds. We work against also the work of our peers. We're always looking sideways or forward, but also backwards. Um, we're working over the work of others all the time. Um, we never design alone in that sense. And the question of precision is also an interesting question, which can up um, frequently when one talks about the kind of craftsmanship and the kind of budgets used uh, in local uh, projects in South America, or at least in Chile. In this studio, uh, the, stu the study of the, of the model, uh, each student is assigned uh, a piece of architecture. They have to work uh, a model as a first kind of interpretation or rather representation of that piece. But we've made it so that they have to work very slow and that the tools are almost inappropriate for the task. So they cannot use sophisticated technology in order to make the model. They have to use solid timber and they have to carve a piece of timber in order to arrive from the crude kind of piece of material onto the reproduction of the project they have at hand. They also have to find out a way of um, decomposing that piece significantly, we say, into two components. Never mind what the project is, you should be able to take it away in two parts. Because the relationship is, is so slow, because the tools are kind of difficult, and uh, um, the process involves kind of tactics, uh, which are material tactics on the one hand, but they also have to do with keeping the integrity of the piece of work. The immersion in relation to that project is completely different. So the kind of light uh, passage we get through on a computer screen when we press the name of Leverance or Le Corbusier, and we have in front of us uh, myriad uh, images. Um, so, but there's also a technical dimension, and the question of precision here is not so much geometric precision, it's more to do with the kind of conceptual precision of understanding what the project was all about. What is at stake uh, in the construction, for example, of this stair uh, that comes from the building by Sterling? Um, so at the end of the day, we have models which are crude at some level, but I bet you that this guy, the guy who studied this, uh, this wonderful museum by CISA in Porto Alegre, really got to understand very well uh, the construction of that building and the conceptual kind of construction that enabled CISA to organize uh, the, the kind of movement within the building to orchestrate the moving, moving in and out of the skin. So Plaza de Armas is, um, of course, it is the most ancient site in Santiago. That's the foundational site of Santiago. It's part of the ritual of the creation of a colonial city. Um, and it, it is born under conditions of uh, construction and manufacture, which had been extremely rudimentary. But it is also born under a set of conceptual tools to do with the grid and the conception of the city brought in by the Spaniards is extremely sophisticated. Like some 400 other cities in the south uh, of the continent, uh, Santiago has proven to be a city that has accommodated change over the years without denaturing that kind of initial uh, instinct or the initial kind of conception of the conqueror. So there is also in Santiago that kind of, in fact, the grid, the famous grid is imperfect. It's not orthogonal. It's got deviations. But conceptually, it is perfect. The deviations maybe give the grid a slight level of vitality. They don't, ma they don't matter very much. We could say that it is a precise uh, instrument. I like to show these examples, which I find interesting. This is um, 
the stands around uh, an arena for the kind of vernacular game of the Rodeo in Chile. As you can see, it's an absolutely elementary craft. Lots of timber, um, nails, but you also see wire kind of uh, joints and so on. There's a sort of imprecision, but the arena itself is absolutely precise. Um, and as we find often, and this is a subject I've been kind of uh, researching, um, the architecture of play, one often finds that there is something which is like a canon, which is the, the arena itself, strongly ruled, often perfect in geometric terms, very strict in dimensional terms, very strict in material terms often, and the latitude, the tolerance, of the construction of its perimeter. Something of the kind we find also in the relationship between form work and resulting building. This is part of the civic quarters in Santiago, Chile. This was built in the 1940s, probably. Um, we use timber extensively to, to, to build with concrete to extend that there is a timber building before there is a concrete building. The timber building is imperfect. The concrete building is as nearly perfect as we could make it at the time. So we have this kind of precision and um, lack of precision, this kind of conceptual precision, and this kind of latitude or tolerance in the making of spaces. We find it all over the place. Um, this is a small hamlet in the northern part of Chile, in the desert. Um, absolute desert in the Atacama Desert. Um, I like the image because it talks about the importance of the public domain, which in this case is represented by uh, a football pitch. And the way these people make the football pitch is by moving earth from somewhere else in to the site, leveling the site and distributing this piece of earth. It's almost, I find it very, very touching that so much effort has been gone into the creation of something which has got an occasional use and is a, an expendable use in a sense. Uh, it is only for playing games. Craftsmen, this is Plaza de Armas. This is on site now. Um, we are paving the streets with cobblestones. We're upgrading the, the kind of the level of paving that we could afford in the first project. There's nothing special about it except that the material quality is good. Uh, stone craftsmen are fantastic in Chile. It's one of the only trades, I would say, that has got a real tradition. But what I want to refer, um, in particular, in relation to this issue of, of, of um, perfection and imperfection, or accuracy, inaccuracy, um, precision, imprecision, is that the stonemasons recognize um, in their code a system which they call capricho in Spanish, which is like this one. A capricho is like a set of instructions which enables them to uh, innovate as they, as, they, as they go. So that you give them a drawing, but more than a drawing, you give them certain instructions as to the sizes, the rhythms, and so on. Um, and they can improvise, and they like that because it is more creative and it is more entertaining to do. But the cobblestone, which is not a capriccio, is a stone paving which is conceptually designed as if every piece was exactly the same as the other, but in reality, what you give them is also a certain degree of latitude as regards the numbers, uh, the, the dimensions, um, which enables them to respond to the task, to produce the paving, and to uh, create something which is homogeneous, but is vital. It's, it's got kind of uh, the vitality of uh, the handcraft. Um, so some of these issues are built into the codes of the uh, crafts. Uh, some of them are to do more with the conceptual uh, vision of the project. Um, when we confront low budgets, impossible timetables, which is the usual kind of picture currently is, is our problem on site, um, we have to be tactic all the time. We have to be where to be precise and where to make decisions and where to let go. 
So the lecture is about the common ground, Plaza de Armas. Um, and Plaza de Armas belongs to the idea of the Spanish square. Um, it would be interesting to, to, to discuss in the format of the Latitude Conference the distinction between a plaza and the common, the Anglo-Saxon kind of convention or invention for the common space, even the name of it is interesting, and the uh, kind of Latin, Latin America, Spanish America, maybe slightly different in, in Brazil, uh, conception of the Plaza de Armas, which is also related to military use originally. Plaza de Armas is at the heart of this big metropolis. Santiago is now about six and a half million people. Um, and it obviously forms part of the city's uh, DNA. And it is formally recognized as a heritage space. Um, through the works of the 1997 uh, uh, remodeling of the plaza, which was initiated by construction of the underground, um, archaeologists uh, did some important kind of discoveries about uh, the look and the fabric of the plaza in the former colonial years. But recently, something much more interesting has emerged because someone discovered that, in fact, this had been an Inca cancha. A cancha, which would translate for field, is uh, the Inca denomination for an explanade, usually a space with a ritual significance, and usually also with some kind of cosmic significance, which seems to be the case in Plaza de Armas. So recently, this year, we came to realize that we were talking about not a new Spanish foundation, we're talking about Spanish deciding to place a square exactly on top of the uh, indigenous uh, kind of installation and with obvious kind of uh, ideological or whatever uh, connotation. They were not founding, they were kind of refounding. Um, but we have no material significant material kind of uh, um, uh, proofs of this event. Just very small things have emerged, and through documents and a series of other things, uh, people have reached the conclusion that this was an Inca square. Um, in talking about Plaza de was one is talking necessarily about history, and also that's also a reason why I talk about the discipline. Architecture is a kind of repository, not just uh, something that is being um, challenged or addressed every time one is doing a project, but as a kind of repository of knowledge and experiences. And at the end, the city also as a kind of choral work. There's no author any longer in the city. It's just an infinite concatenation of actions that create the city. So here we have the first... Um, depictions of the city. These plans were drawn at our practice by Mauricio Peso um, when he was working with us at the time. Um, so he produced a series of, of plans, uh, slightly um, uh, schematic drawings to show that when he's talking about space that keeps its identity over time, but the space which at the same time is all about moving identities. There are two kind of movements, one of historical kind of continuity, the other one of uh, leaving an imprint every time over the same space. Um, originally, what you get is a square, the church sideways to the square, so the square was more like a, a burial place, was not the atrium of the church, and some of the public institutions beginning to use this and this areas here, the others being residential. Very simple, very diagrammatic scheme. Um, the square is obviously absolutely empty, and that's the point about it. Just like the cancha, just like the playing field, it is an entity that draws its strength from emptiness. It's a non-project, in a sense. 
and it is the representation of the crown in this remote place in Chile. Second stage, um, the church has shifted orientation, very significant, because now the square becomes more like the atrium of the church. It becomes like the anteroom of that main public space in Santiago. While this is happening, uh, obviously, there's a consolidation of the edges here. At the time, this is empty. There is just one fountain in the middle, which is for the provision of, of water for the citizens of Santiago. There's some other small kind of monuments or uh, ba very basic, uh, sorry, structures for marketplaces, stuff like that. And there are accounts of um, bullfights being fought uh, within Plaza de Armas. And this here is the first bullring that was designed in the 18th century, Santiago, late 18th century, as uh, something to be built outside uh, the grid, uh, to be located somehow outside uh, the main spaces. And that was kind of, uh, the look of it is, was probably like this one, and this looks also talking about precision and tolerance, very interesting, precise circle, and uh, very kind of activated perimeter. This is in Rueda in Spain, but the pattern is exactly the same. Um, the plaza was the place where everything happened. Um, and the reason for colonnades and for balconies often had to do more with the existence of full bullfights than with uh, a provision of spaces for the domestic spaces that were behind those. So the place is still empty. Greenery, public greenery, uh, reaches Santiago in this form. Before we had parks, we had promenades. And that's also Spanish kind of pattern. Um, and there's a notion of the square as a theater. The emptiness of the square is exactly like the arena of the theater. It's an empty space, so they can set up a place on it. Um, institutions begin to emigrate from the square. There's a kind of centripetal motion. This is a little bit like the Big Bang. Uh, the square is where everything else, and there is a kind of movement out of the square so that the seat of government, the seat of justice, and so on, begin to move away. Um, and this, these spaces here were designed as tribunes for the kind of spectacles we had in the square, primarily for that, exactly as in uh, some public plazas in Spain, some Plaza Mayor, for example, in Madrid, which has got similar uh, conception, much more sophisticated, but along similar lines. The third stage is with independence. Um, interestingly, as soon as, as the country becomes independent by 1918, the plaza changes its name. It becomes Independence Square. The name didn't stick very long, um, but they removed the signs of Spanish dominance. Um, and it is my interpretation, but maybe an historian should, should corroborate that. They introduced a very small garden here in the middle so that they introduce the substitute, the notion of the emptiness, by the notion of an ornamental garden. And this garden begins to expand outwards until it fills up the square. This story, which I find interesting, is the story, is the pattern followed by almost every single square in America. I believe, I might be wrong, but I believe that Socal in Mexico City was also at some point colonized by a garden, which was then taken away in order to restore the emptiness of that magnificent uh, space. Um, so that now you see, this is late uh, 19th century, um, now the notion of the public park comes into the scene in Santiago, and you see the various institutions of Republican government 
related to justice and to secular kind of activities, which would add up to the many religious institutions inherited from the uh, colonial period. Um, the edge of the square is, is paved with stone, as you see here, it's quite rough, but the garden has expanded uh, to the perimeter. In this expansion of the garden, if one thinks now about the square as a place where things happen, um, the emptiness of the colonial square was to do with making available the space for various kind of public uses. The empty square was indeterminate. It was a place for proclamations, but was also a place of justice. Uh, they would hang uh, uh, criminals on the square. They would also uh, realize, obviously, important uh, religious ceremonies, but they would also have bullfights and things of the kind. When the square adopts the garden model, these activities are not any longer possible. We have instead something which appeals more to more aristocratic mood, perhaps, more to the notion of the promenade, to, to be in there, to show yourself, a different kind of cadence, a different kind of movement, um, and obviously a different atmosphere. This is nothing to do with the original notion of the theater. This is much more to do with the romantic notion of the promenade. Um, so these were the two kind of fundamental models of Plaza de Armas. Um, interestingly, the garden becomes like a, an exotic garden, uh, a little bit like a botanic garden. Uh, there's not a single native uh, tree in there. They're all imported from various parts of the world. Um, and it has got that kind of uh, uh, quality, which becomes perhaps more accentuated through this uh, remodeling done by a French. Uh, um, landscape designer, where you get this kind of uh, pattern, it's quite conventional in a way, but you also get things like a kiosk with music, and also with the Ottoman kind of uh, um, resonance of a bit of Orientalism. Um, lots of benches, which are called sofas, also falling from that Ottoman kind of uh, Orientalist uh, thing. Um, and obviously, here, the pace of movement within the square is very slow. So the notion of the emptiness of the, of the, of the, of the original is completely erased and substituted by something which has got a completely different rhythm and atmosphere. From then on, it's just a question of um, changes of a different kind. Maybe the types of trees uh, change, trees grow taller, uh, the buildings in the perimeter are substituted and so on. The city begins to grow, uh, you get other public utilities, better lighting, wherever. And Santiago is bigger. Um, the square is not any longer the only place, or not maybe the, the main kind of public arena in Santiago, but always it keeps the notion of being the origin of the city. Um, you get commerce, as in other cities. Uh, you get systems of arcades expanding into blocks and so on. Um, and more recently, you get the upper classes moving away from, from the space, uh, far away into the mountains. Um, and near the square, you find things like this is Colonial House, which is now a museum. And this is the oldest uh, steel structure in Santiago, a little bit like those constructions in Soho, New York. Um, which is also a public monument, but it's a, it's, it's a commercial space. So, by now, Santiago is a large town with uh, lots of critical problems, with uh, enormous immigration from the countryside and all the kind of story of uh, cities of this kind. Um, and somehow, even the, the drawing of the square is now uh, and then there are trees all over the place, uh, and the place is somehow uh, decayed and disorganized, uh, and the, 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 the quality of the planting is, is also quite decayed at that stage. Before they call for the competition, there was an important moment uh, in South
South America. This was 1992, the celebration of 500 years of the encounter between the peoples or the um, uh, colonization of uh, these countries. And <clears throat> so we had big debates about the meaning of that in terms of Plaza de Armas, just to show that space is an emblematic space. This is the figure of the conqueror, Pedro de Valdivia, and this was created in 1992 as a monument to the indigenous people. Very kind of, people don't like that monument very much at all, but the point is that the plaza was the arena where you uh, reestablish the sense of equilibrium between these two forces. And in that sense, it retains that kind of emblematic uh, value. The other event uh, of the time was the construction of the underground, which uh, has to excavate a large part of the plaza, and also uh, will bring up the possibility of emerging through that space for the first time in the life of Plaza de Armas. So that was the context of our competition. Um, and what we did, which is actually quite elementary, um, very, very simple, um, though we thought it was correct, I still think it's a correct thing to do, but it's not, it's not a very special idea in a sense, but it's simply to, to combine the two formats. The colonial format is now alive uh, around the institutional sites of the plaza, and the romantic format the shaded plaza, which is something people really like as well, is being now removed. In removing it, um, what we did was to also displace the center, where you before you had one center, now you have two, which to some extent shows that things are of a different kind uh, when you look at the plaza from a contemporary viewpoint. Um, that was the essence of our scheme. So here you have this is the conqueror, this is the indigenous people movement, this is the places where we managed to locate with minimal disruption to the surface uh, the uh, connections from the underground. And then there are some subtle topographic moves, like for example to build this up or to raise this up slightly in relation to, 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 to the perimeter, to move the kiosk from these which have become a very noisy road into these which has quite a place. Um, so very, very basic kind of uh, decisions. Um, in contrast to the competitors, the competition that they were excavating the plaza everywhere in order to establish the so-called three-dimensional public space, we thought that at all costs, and we still find that it is very, very important to retain the continuity of that ground and in no way to uh, obstruct it. Um, so there is a geometrical matrix um, which works through this kind of shifting of one element within the other one. It's like a containment of, of a small garden square within a larger um, urban square. The competition, <clears throat> this was the first play we did using, um, using digital uh, systems. Um, so the drawings were rather primitive in a way, but till then all our work had been handcrafted. Um, we were planning to put 100 palm trees here, which were Washingtonians from California. It's very slender, very tall palm tree. We want to have this upper horizon of palms. Um, and in doing so, we were infiltrating this kind of the reminiscences of this uh, romantic uh, garden with a very strict gridded system, so that the grid of the city was invading somehow the heart of the plaza as well. The reality of it was obviously much more complicated. Uh, there was a lot of, as I'm going to show, a lot of uh, debates about this place as, as it should indeed happen with, with the transformation of this kind. Um, and there was some compromises. We changed the type of trees and so on. We ended up with criteria of lines of trees, which is what you see here as a gridded thing, which is somehow infiltrated and superimposed to the remnant trees from the old square. 
Interestingly, in our, uh, our Part T, when it talks about Part T, the emptiness of these spaces is exactly what this Spanish, French, sorry, French uh, architect did in creating the National Congress uh, by the end of the 19th century, where he creates a garden in the two fronts of the Congress and he pushes the box into, uh, into the edge of the block, creating like the reverse, the figure ground kind of reversal of what we did without at the time uh, understanding that. But that's just a chance effect. So we had uh, obviously to weave uh, this proposition um, through the pre-existing elements. We had the three monuments. Uh, the central one is kind of paradoxical, is a celebration to the Ayacucho battle. It's nothing to do with the Chilean independence. It arrived to Chile by mistake, but people decided to keep it in the middle of Plaza de Armas all the same. So it is still there. Um, there was a vertical dimension. We could look at it. We could look at it as a system of floor platforms, let's say, with these subtle uh, topographic changes. But we could look at it also in terms of strata, because there was the underground, the towers, uh, the, the, the trees themselves, and so on. But created also because it is like a window to the sky. Therefore, the silhouette uh, becomes quite an important element. In So you can read it as, a, as an array of uh, elements that change the density and configuration as you move your eyes onto the sky. Um, we had to construct the project. This was like a, an inverse acupuncture operation. We extracted the trees from the edges there, and we had to infiltrate uh, the trees with, with this kind of uh, geometric matrix with the least uh, possible damage. Um, and in doing so, this was conceptual, this was a competition submission drawing. In doing so, we tried to reinforce the notion of two ecologies or two conditions, a sunny condition and a sheltered condition, um, a shaded area, a density on the one side, openness on the other. Um, so it is quite elementary. And I think the strength of it, uh, if there is any strength to the project, is actually to keep on to that simple, precise line. Also because if one is talking about the common ground, um, the construction of the common ground is a particularly complicated affair. There are too many people uh, with opinions, and there's no one taking decisions. Um, we had fountains. We were proposing these water jets um, on the northern side, which had the effect. Those were, we said, this is the only new monument we want in the square. We don't want to clutter the space. We want to empty out the space, except for the trees that we're placing. We don't want to put any other emblematic figure or anything of the kind. But water um, could become like a new monument. Um, jets that come up from the ground, they would also bring uh, a quality of scale, of sound, and of temperature, which would be important. That part of it was never realized. So who are the agents here? On the one hand, uh, it, this is a public arena. So you find early 20th century, you still find uh, or late 19th century, early 20th century, still find important public ceremonial, mainly related to the cathedral, that kind of invades the space of the squares in this funeral. More recently, this was one priest who had fought against the dictatorship in one of the working class areas where the, the struggle was, was stronger. And his burial place takes a particularly kind of strong moment within Plaza de Armas. He's taken to the cathedral in a kind of a symbolic, highly symbolic uh, move. But you also have this kind of question of preachers, and certain patterns of association, people in the square. 
or simply the kind of day-to-day -day relaxed mood of a large city. So you have the public, you have to, the day-to-day -day public, you have the crowds, uh, the mass of the city that at some point feels that they must size the space and make the presence felt in Plaza de Armas because of the importance of the space. You also have the press. Um, this was being published as we were developing the project so that we were drawing lines at the same time. We had to go to newspapers or to radio or television sometimes to try to defend the project. There was a lot of discussion about it, a lot of misrepresentation of it through these kinds of diagrams. But this is actually what percolates onto the public about the public space and makes the issue of moving through that space and trying to organize things within it particularly uh, complex. So, <clears throat> with the project, we have this historian um, who said this is the Requiem to Plaza de Armas, just destroying the spaces with very strong words. Um, and actually, um, not easy for us to, to, to react to that. It's like feeling frontal attack. A desert made of concrete, tropical breeze over Plaza de Armas because of the palm trees, from Macondo to modernity, an urban contribution, so this, obviously these opinions were also kind of disconnected. You couldn't make much out of summing up uh, public opinion. Time gave us some um, confirmation of some of our expectations because the space actually was began to be used again as a public theater um, through concerts or various events. And people began to appreciate that. So that the, this dual kind of matrix of the square was beginning to become part of a habit or some kind of a public tradition. We had people who made use of the square as a space for um, selling and buying. This is typical of our squares, obviously. Um, and who were sometimes in conflict with authorities, sometimes not, but we had to be accommodated as well. And people like these, like clubs, for example, that wanted to use the space, this kind of tradition as a chess playing game. And also you have, when you're talking about the public space or public domain, um, you have these kinds of um, um, materials or documents uh, or expressions which filter more into some kind of popular culture like children books and stuff like that. So what happens now? They call us not very long before um, Barbara invited me to, to come. We got a call from the municipality asking us to come very quickly to take care of some works in Plaza de Armas. Our schedule of time was very short. Uh, it was an improvement scheme um, that within tight budgets and so on, but the question was, how can you do it so that you can improve space which should be left uh, abandoned from a point of view of maintenance for a long, long time, 14 years. We had done, uh, in the meantime, a project for the crypt of the cathedral. Wilfred made uh, a comment. Um, he talked about the almost invisible intervention. I think it is correct that both in the crypt we were acting underneath the arena in a way. We had to reconstruct the presbytery also, obviously. But the question was how can you slide into the cathedral uh, this new space without disturbing uh, the image of the space as it existed before? Um, and last year we did a competition for the National Museum in Santiago. Um, this is Plaza de Armas. So we were adding this body at the back and we were trying to expand the connection of public spaces that weaves through the sides and it connects to these interior gardens which are unknown to, to the Chilean public or to the public of Santiago. Um, we didn't get anywhere with the scheme. 
are within Winner Prize. We have the, the plan of Santiago here, in the undercroft of this small lecture hall. And this is as it would be if we were looking from that hidden garden onto a museum, onto a square, as a sequence of space. It would be nice to have been doing this project. It was very nice idea of working now on the perimeter of the square. Um, also, during the much publicized uh, student unrest uh, uh, events uh, that occurred during last year, there was this uh, open class given in Plaza de Armas, so that again, the place was recognized as a theater where something momentous occurs, and these people use the emptiness of the square rather than the area of the trees. There are five measures, uh, political periods and public spaces, they don't go very well together because unlike, um, you know, uh, systems like uh, monarchic systems or, or, or even more with uh, the absolutism of the French kings, you can really plan ahead. Um, dictatorships plan ahead also comfortably, but democracy is, is much more complex. Um, their periods are very short. In color, we have the two ones who were our clients. She's the, the current major. He's the one who was there at the time of competition. This one called us, but he didn't do anything at the end because he, he had to confront the earthquake. Uh, so the fans moved on to other things which are more kind of priorities. So political times, very short political times, um, for a project that really compromises very long spans of time. How do you do with planting? What do you do with the trees? Um, in the 19th century, it would be unacceptable to plant a tree of this scale. We saw it in the square. Um, in the 20th century, the mayor asked us to bring uh, very, very old, 400-year-old palm trees to the square in order to have somehow the project matured and made and visible to the public immediately. Um, in this context, they ask us to do this kind of uh, project, which is a low-key project of activating the, the, the edges of the plaza, uh, trying to introduce uh, open-air uh, service onto one of the fronts of the plaza, and so on. And this rather kitschy image uh, was produced uh, by us under stress uh, because we had to, ha to have something to give onto the press even before we begin to think as to what to do with the project. Um, so that the, the conditions of work were kind of strange. Um, what about sculptures? Um, and this kind of emblematic presence, what is most interesting about it is to think about them as furniture, which is what we did in our project. So you sit down looking away from the sculpture, if you like, or looking at it if you choose to do. We are repaving streets. Uh, before we had time to even look at the, at the heart of the plaza, the whole question of landscaping, which is complicated, we had to do this job because you could only stop the traffic on the street during the summer period, which is ending now, March. Uh, the public was, was, was told about what we were about to do, and the plaza was fenced. What happens? You're confronted with a structure of the public sector, which in our case is divided this way, so that lots of specialists, and each one knows only about a fragment of uh, the problem. No one knows about the relationship between one thing and the other. Only the architect is fighting for uh, keeping, uh, of making sense of the various kind of lines of operation in the project. And that is really, I would say, our main task. So it's not so much a design question, it's a question of keeping the basic consistency of the project moving against all odds. I would say that that's what we're trying to do more to do with emptying out and avoiding disaster than to do with very clever design procedures. 
we tried to reinstate uh, the notion of fountains was really important in terms of, even in terms of the kind of ecological conditions for the landscape, those would ameliorate the temperature of the floor, was suffering from the increase of temperature in Santiago, and the climate of the hard square is quite hostile to the growth of certain trees. This is <coughs> like kind of crude uh, rendering, but this is what, as an idea, I would like to attain, to make it so that we really get a dense foliage in the center against the emptiness of the edge. Um, that foliage is made of exotic flora. This is the process we've seen before, from the empty square to the garden square. And that garden square is interesting uh, because it is a kind of summation of the richness of flora in various parts of the world. These are some of the basic trees we have, like from Brazil, from the United States, or from Argentina and Uruguay. Um, so that the, the, the listing of trees uh, uh, tells us about the notion of mixing up this exotic flora. In that sense, I think it's interesting to think of landscaping as an area where now the discussion about native plants against uh, exotic plants goes very strong. But it is interesting to see that the whole of 19th century landscaping was to do with the introduction of exotic. And the fabric of our landscape, the inhabited landscape in the valley around Santiago, is all exotic, which has now become a tradition. Like, for example, the wineries. We, had, we introduced uh, the palm tree, which, as I said before, is an is a, is a extraordinary tree, um, being very, very old. It's also the southernmost form of plant, palm tree that one finds. But we had to bear in mind that, from the point of view of, of the climate, Santiago is probably closer to somewhere between New Mexico and California than it is to the east coast of the United States or to this area. Um, it is dry. It is at the edge of the desert. And in fact, the greenery in Santiago is all brought in through irrigation, not through rain. It's the mountains that provide us with water to sustain uh, this uh, quality of greenery. So this is the source of the palm tree. And we could understand the urban garden as a kind of transplant, or something that has been removed from natural habitat into a strange uh, urban artificial habitat. And this is why we like to have the palm trees. They give us a structure which is like a columnar structure. They're gray, they're tall, and they're very kind of hefty, like Doric columns. Um, and in looking at the floors, um, we are now searching for types of plantings that would be resisting to pollution, to vandalism, to doves and animals, and to all sorts of things in that space that would give us uh, the kind of lushness that we need, and also the mix of color and vivacity that we need to sustain over the year. So these are drawings that were just exploring the subject. Um, we will have planters, which are more to do with sunny sides, and planters with more to do with uh, kind of shaded areas, but we have to keep this mix of color in all of them. So our expectation is simply to make stronger that contrast, which is at the basis of our party the green against the dry, the original square and the original streets in Colonial Santiago, which had no trees, were called dry streets, uh, as streets without watering. So we're now tracing on the floor of the square. This week, I go back to see the tracings of this, uh, the layout uh, and to see it on site, because we have no time to, to draw almost. Um, in order to attain this, but this also brings us a problem, which is how do we make sure that the inaugural day would have enough vitality, enough greenery, um,
to to make it uh, somehow worth the, the whole period of time that has been enclosed. Um, how to combine the greenery in the ground with the color of the foliage above. Um, how to orchestrate maybe the uses of the edges with the colors of the square within. We did this uh, cast uh, bronze uh, relief works of the Plan of Santiago, which are located in the plaza. This has become popular among tourists and visitors. Um, and we thought maybe we should do some kind of installation for the square so that, for once, uh, because we have this window opportunity, which is inaugural day now, we might be able to fill up the void with things, uh, which could be flags or plants or things that people might take home, or candles maybe. We have to look into this. But uh, for once, we could do a kind of reversal and also game of scale in the square, which that we might be able to, to, to have the privilege to do that uh, on that single occasion. So as you can see, it is work in progress. It's very basic. Uh, and it's kind of tactical. We have to, to take care all the time for budget reasons and also so for operational reasons, extremely tactical. Um, the urban public domain, how is it the public domain within a modern democratic state? So people have the right to have good public spaces. How do you design something lasting and good um, in a system which has kind of diffuse authorities, as in a good democratic system, you don't have very clear authorities, and you have lots of, lots of constituencies who want to decide. How do you make one right decision? In this case, we thought it is very important to keep this party. In fact, we come to the point of the party. And this is an open question. We hope that we do it correctly this time. That's it. Thank you very much. Well, this is about history. Um, and I think it's the last point I want to make, but it is, it, is, it is a point about history in place like Chile, for example, where the, the, if you have, let's say in a Roman scenario, you have uh, heavy expressions of history. In the square, actually the oldest thing we have is the palm tree, which has been brought off in from somewhere else. It's older than any of the buildings around. There's not a single piece that will stand up to that kind of, uh, of presence and weight as you find in a European scenario like the classical world. And this is about not only work in progress, it's about the collective nature of the construction of space like that. It's really one generation taking over from the next one and uh, contributing to its making. It's not an open process. It's not a closed process. It's essentially open and it's like coral. That's it. wonderful presentation and it uh, I have to say it was very refreshing to see this discussion of public space take part in latitudes so it's, uh, it's been a it's been a great afternoon uh, let me invite my colleagues Dean Almi and Coleman Cooker to take the table to do their responses and also the four presenters of the afternoon of this afternoon Fernanda Punchy, Sonia, uh, Joshua, and Rodrigo.
So continuing with the latitude tradition of the debate, I will ask Coleman maybe to speak first. He's a little younger in Austin than, than Dean. Is this on? Yeah. All right. Um, first of all, thanks to uh, the presenters' fantastic work these past two days. I want to uh, talk about not just today's work, but uh, work work that we saw yesterday and today, focusing on today. And um, I believe that um, three points I'd like to make um, would get to the question that came up yesterday. I believe. Kevin Alter made this mention of the business of architecture. Um, and as it plays out in these um, seven presenters here, and uh, what is the realm of designers? That's the question that um, has come up several times, both uh, explicitly and, and implicitly in the, in the work uh, here. And the first, uh, for me, that I saw uh, has to do with place, engendering a care uh, for place through, through these works that have been made. And uh, what we see effectively employed in much of the works uh, presented here today. In uh, yesterday's discussion um, at the end um, of, of the talk, there seemed to be uh, um, a search for a consensus of what uh, those three uh, presenters' work was about. And uh, this to me seemed to be not uh, necessarily the question at hand. And in fact, uh, instead, what interested me, what was different about the works? And that had to do with, with place, a response to the specific needs of the owner as well as the specific uh, conditions of, of that place. And I found that to be um, the same today in, in the projects, uh, both, uh, both cultural and political. And uh, we certainly saw that in uh, the project in uh, Koya Khan, um, how, how uh, the urbanity there and how uh, the cultural center and the social housing work uh, were some, some response uh, to place. And I, I felt that uh, Kevin also threw down the uh, gauntlet yesterday when in his opening remarks he said that latitude was some, to some great extent about a, developing an, a forum for the authentic, an architecture born of place, Kevin, I think he said uh, in that regard. And um, I think we see that uh, today as well in the work and the, the seven presenters. And the way that I saw this uh, play out was that place was giving a grounding for each of the projects. And uh, each of those impacts of place were different on, on the works of, of the seven presenters. Place seemed to me to give uh, each of the works their pith, their texture, and uh, specific character. And uh, to me, this offered the folks who inhabit these works uh, perhaps a little different uh, perspective on how they might see their relationship to that specific place that they're part of, and even to the greater world. And I find a, a lot of value in that. And it, it's the great gift of uh, what we see here today um, in, in the projects, that uh, uh, the ability to see uh, one's own world, perhaps in a fresh light, through the de designs that uh, were presented here. And uh, the second um, uh, point to make that uh, I found uh, interesting was one of incertitude uh, that was brought up yesterday in uh, Senor Barragan's uh, uh, presentation. It struck me that um, uh, incertitude uh, versus certainty and the way that uh, we often preach certainty in school and uh, the fact that uh, David pointed out that some of us can in our practice and in, in our teaching um, think more about uh, incertitude, uh, uncertainty, as, as a means of uh, looking for questions. Not necessarily answers, but questions. Certain aspects uh, this way for me and through the projects uh, remained open for discovery, uh, even a sense of mystery and uh, possibility of delight. We saw that, I think, in uh, Joshua's work today when um, he spoke about letting um, the contractors uh, help guide the design uh, to some extent of the project. And I found a lot of value in that. And uh, what we saw was uh, that each design decision could be a kind of question, a uh, poetic inquiry from the bottom up rather than the top down. And I think that was also uh, evident in Francisco and, and Sonia's work as well 
um, in um, much of the craft that uh, was uh, uh, shown, shown in their work. And this way of uh, approaching each project that we've seen here today offers an opportunity for the work's inhabitants to inquire about their own place in the world. And that, to me, seems to be the value of, of good architecture. The work's offering the, the possibility of reflective questioning, both on a personal and a, and a cultural basis. And for me, this is the, the deep realm of, of poetic making. And so uh, the third point uh, that was made, and I um, 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 have to thank Carlos for this uh, in his presentation, uh, is hope. I think that these projects uh, uh, engender a great deal of hope. Um, uh, architecture is inherently um, about uh, looking towards the future, an act of investment for future generations. And this was manifested in, in everyone's projects uh, that we saw. And I, I believe it uh, was also used, uh, in perhaps the way Carlos was describing it, in the context of doing the right thing, hope of doing the right thing as designers, a work of being an affirmative, of affirmation of its culture, its time, and its place. Um, in uh, this light of hopelessness, yesterday, uh, Pezzo brought up uh, morality and ethics. And I really appreciated that conversation. It, it, um, I thought it was important in a forum such as this. And uh, they're, they're, they're vital questions for us, not only as practitioners, but um, as teachers, uh, as we discuss in, in school today. And Pezzo also brought up the fact of poor and rich architecture. And we saw that in, in today's projects uh, as well. And I took this, uh, maybe liberally, Pezzo, but uh, uh, is how do we act responsibly? What is, as designers, how do we act uh, in a responsible way to a fellow mem members in, in our community? And um, in light of that, I can't help but note that this is April the 4th, and it's the uh, 46th six, six, uh, year um, anniversary of Dr. King's assassination uh, today, April the 4th, uh, in Memphis. And um, Dr. King, if he preached anything, he preached hope. And um, I think that extends to, to our work as practitioners. In light of hope, he spoke uh, about community participation and about the responsibility of doing the right thing. And uh, so to me, it seems the questions here that comes out of the symposium, the work we saw today as well as yesterday, uh, through all the re remarkable projects, is as uh, Wilford asked, when a building is good, what makes it good? And um, he, I think you began to answer that question, Wilfred, in, um, in its goodness, does, does a building make a model for practice? And uh, through that work I, I, today uh, and yesterday, I see that um, in a very positive light. Does that model include the op opportunity of acting responsibly, um, doing the right thing? And uh, Rodrigo's talk, I think, exemplifies that uh, very much in, in what we just saw here. So. From another point of view, and perhaps I'm being uh, a liberal in, in the interpretation of, of um, acting responsibly, um, the right thing could be uh, participating in your community for the good of all of the community and not just for a privileged few. And I, I saw that uh, in much of the work here presented. To me, that would be um, looking at, at the larger aspects of the community as, as doing the right thing uh, offering good design for all, regardless of their, their economic capability. For me, uh, that would be a model of good practice. And I believe it would be acting responsibility uh, in a responsible way, but more important as a hopeful act, um, and as we've seen here in, over the past few days in, in these works. And uh, for me, reflecting on these things, these three points, um, is the importance of this symposium through the, through the uh, seven presenters. It's been the, the most meaningful thing that I think has come out of it, uh, presented here over the past few days. And for me, uh, beyond just architecture as a small A, uh, but architecture as a uh, reaching out to the community as, as a big A, that's a hopeful act. And, and I really appreciate um, um, all that's been presented here. Thank you, Coleman. Uh, let me pass the microphone to Dean. So, as I, as I sat here in the last two days and um, watched
watched the various presentations, and I tried to sort of construct in my mind some sense of framework through which to begin to respond to the body of projects. Um, uh, on the one hand, um, having a kind of narrow frame linguistically, I think, and on the other hand, a really wide range of purpose in terms of their scale and their reaction to the community and the culture and the climate, etc. Uh, I began to think about uh, Kevin's opening remarks um, and the sort of uh, impetus behind the uh, creation of latitudes and sort of the two defi definitions of latitudes, right? One which it provides a kind of metric against which we measure things. Um, and the other one, which the def which you know, if one looks up the definition, is a scope for freedom of action or thought. And it's that degree of openness that actually I find really compelling in all the work that I, that I um, saw today. And so I was thinking about how could openness become, in a way, uh, a, a structure with uh, against which to begin to respond to a number of these projects. And I was thinking, you know. Perhaps there, are, so I came up with a list of about six or seven degrees with which one could begin to measure openness. Um, architecture uh, open to the city. Architecture open to the landscape. Architecture open to climate. Architecture culturally open, materially open. Architectural practice as open. Um, time as open, and to some degree, program as open. And in this regard, I, f I find it really remarkable that if, if, you know, with my apologies perhaps to uh, Rodrigo, if one of the purposes of Latitudes is to discover undiscovered sort of young, uh, upper, up and coming architects, what I, <laughs> what I, what I, you know, what we knew about you in the 70s. <laughs> um, what I found to be really remarkable is the way in which um, we have a broad swath of young architects who are redefining what it means to kind of practice architecture in a much more open way um, across a kind of range of sort of um, cultural uh, material practices. And um, this, this, this idea that somehow, as Coleman just brought up, that we begin to uh, kind of proceed perhaps through hope, uh, maybe I would also sort of interject the term through an optimistic idea that we're going to somehow bring things to resolution, but we're going to do it in an open way that allows us to give up a certain amount of control, give that control to an engineer, give that control to labor, give that control to the kind of um, availability of material, um, and to have faith that somehow the, the production of architecture uh, is going to be okay, <laughs> even even in the context of this kind of degree of um, procedural openness, I think has been, for me, a pretty remarkable slice um, across the entire range of projects that I've seen in the last couple of days. Thank you. You know, it's... I think you're right that it's it's amazing to have Rodrigo here to with a different scale in, in, in space and a slightly different scale in time. I mean the, you're working with that the Plaza de Armas for almost twenty years now. Uh, there's a there's a depth to that that, that allows you to to uh, master that space. Uh, and maybe uh, maybe bring the issue of time when you bring a palm tree that is 400 years old and that brings the history with it uh, to that landscape. So the, the issues of time that I use to introduce uh, Punchy and Sonia, uh, maybe we can overlap that with the issues of place, which define us. I don't know if somebody wants to comment on that or if you want to respond to uh, so that, is that a different time in the Americas that, uh, that we run by? Well, in a sense, I think time is quite relative to space, to space and to culture, actually. For us, for example, um, probably partly because of earthquakes, old buildings in common parlance in Chile and in Argentina 
still the case of not to have the information in case you need to take time to do so. Not to take it mm -hmm. away from you. So time is it's quite relative. Um, the relationship of um, people to time is also very different, I think. The notion of, for example, a very rich family who has had a grand house somewhere in downtown Santiago has moved five times over the lifetime to, to live now somewhere in the, up, in the in the mountains. And they have no particular attachment to that old house. Uh, so they have breaking up uh, with time in a different sense that other people in other contexts probably. So I think it's quite relative. This relativeness of time, it has to do also with the, the they were mentioning about how to open to certain particularities, how time is interpreted in different cities, and it has to do also with this latitude project. How do we look again to our particular conditions? How uh, we not only face, as David Barran was saying yesterday to uh, what's been do uh, what people are doing in Europe and in the United States that at least was the way uh, my generation grew up in Mexico just envying uh, what uh, developed countries uh, achieved and giving the back to what we were capable of doing uh, almost hiding or uh, trying to to neglect the particular conditions. So in a way, I think um, it's really positive that now we're opening up to different latitudes and understanding the qualities, not as a defect, uh, the difference, not as a, a defect, but just as a different opportunities. The risk I, I see in that is that it becomes only a fashion. And, and at least um, I'm beginning to feel sometimes it's not only how to be responsible, but it's actually how to look responsible and how to look, like uh, how to take this like arte povera style and uh, trying to make the clay works and the handcraft just look a little rougher so that we actually look um, uh, from uh, this uh, perspective. Uh, so I feel it. It has this uh, condition of a really positive uh, thinking, but also just a risk of uh, falling into this uh, image or just a, a, a very empty discourse. And going back to Jean Almi's response, it's not only about what you hope, it's also about what you close, what you decide to avoid or not to work with. Or well, I, I was various sort of experience of my past were going through my head as I was listening to various things. And one of, one of the sort of um, events that I remember from my youth as, an art, as, as a younger architect was a, a, a conference in Delft in, in the 1980s that Rem Kohlhaas held when he, gave, when he gave up his professorship at the university. And, and the conference was titled you know, this was 89, I think, how modern is Dutch modern architecture? And it was a rhetorical question because it had to do with the question of language and the fact that we all thought, you know, we, not me, them, uh, all thought they were being modern, but if it, what, what they were doing was looking to a pretty well historically established language architecturally, you know, the big square window, the transparent wall, the kind of Neonesian, neo Le Corbusian you know, sort of linguistic response in architecture, which is still, I, I found really very pervasive, even in the work that we saw today, whether it was in Canada or whether it was in, you know, South America, there's an amazing, I think, kind of, you know, if I'm going to be provocative here, abstraction that is linguistically pervasive um, architecturally through a lot of the kind of architectural work that I think we've seen. And um, th there's this sort of question for me about 
how can the younger generation of architects begin to break out of this in order to begin, if, if, if that's important, uh, in order to begin to use this sort of new, maybe not new, kind of open practice um, to start to uh, evolve architecture in a way that can be um, a little bit more forward looking and a little bit less um, backward looking linguistically. Yeah, I, I, I think the open practice is a great thing to discuss because we have Joshua becoming a partner with a restaurant in order to make it happen. Uh, Rodrigo having to design things on the floor uh, of the plaza because there was no time to uh, to to engage and, and Fernanda fighting all levels of uh, conservation hysteria in order to to build a library out of a, out of a house. So there's there's lots of openness and risk taking in in those practices and, and of course you guys building yourselves. Uh, in order to do it well. Anybody in the audience wants to follow up on that? I wonder if I can change, I'm going to take a, a totally different slant on this, which is less about language and more about um, attitude and intention. Um, and I think to, to affirm, the one thing I, I may observe of the work that we've seen this week is that rarely is the case that the architect has approached the problem statement in an additive way. But they've approached it in an extractive manner. And it's an idea that we talk a lot about in our own practice, about how to extract what's always either been there or extract what, what's always wanted or needed to be there. And it's a very, very different attitude than adding something to the context. And it's a very humble starting point. Um, and one that, again, it, it's the antithesis of, antithesis of trying to be the smartest person in the room. It's the person who comes to the table and and ideally asks a lot of questions and and just sits back and observes and allows other people to enter the solution stage as opposed to speaking, being the loudest voice in the room. And I would say that all of the presenters here have been extremely humble in their kind of extractive approach. I, I don't know. Which is not to take away from the language question, because I think what ultimately will happen, I think, is that as technology continues to march forward, the science of architecture is going to become more and more sophisticated. It demands to be more sophisticated, because it has to be more equally performative as it does aesthetic. And that as we our toolkit begins to expand and stretch, I think you're going to see form morphing to respond to that new palette of materials, potentially. Okay. Um, I think that as a sort of Dean's provocative question, you know, like, is it relevant as if you, um, if you have let's say, people from, let's say, from a younger generation, almost a student generation, or so just um, newly graduates, you know, five years, 10 years building experience, and then, you know, so people with 30 uh, years of building experience, and maybe even longer, do they have something in common? Is there sort of, do, do we produce values, or you know, so do we establish ethics or so that are, durable and valid longer than just 10 years? Is that, you know, what modernism is about, sort of that you have to reinvent every decade something new because you cannot carry through, you know, so, or is it, you know, is it just the opposite, you know, so that you start, 
with a set of questions and you mature and mature and mature and sort of and it's an attitude that has that becomes a kind of a universal or um, you know value as sort of that it adds value to something that's there and I think as especially when you you know sort of what, what we saw in in today's exercises is sort of when you um, when you uh, when you exist when you respect the existing and you you just understand you know sort of how little you can add you know and how little change you can actually add and sort of how how humble you have to be as a, so in order if it's a building if it's a kind of a um, what Josh um, showed you know sort of that little let's say a remarkable site not such a remarkable building but sort of something that that became a landmark that might not have become a landmark 50 years ago, you know, because our attitude towards the city was a different one, or sort of what, what um, Rodrigo showed, you know, sort of in that square, as to how it changed meaning and um, aesthetics and, you know, so sort of what we think, what is what is trendy and so on, and then also in, in Fernanda's opportunity, you know, sort of to have that kind of a house that was a house, a residential building that is, um, you know, can change program and meaning and sort of it's um, so, but it, it, it's very little, and it's um, you know, so it's on the one hand, you know, so that you, of course, you always look back. Of course, you you have to to value, to respect what's there, and then you know, so I think what was really interesting is sort of that that kind of attitude that you that you are aware of that little thing you can change, sort of, um, but in the in the long run, you know, it's adding adding to the to the um, sort of the change of attitude in the city or the change of attitude in architecture and it's changing slowly um, the let's say how we how we live in our cities and I thought that was a really interesting sequence as that we that we saw today and it's also a, it's interesting you know, sort of to see that um, maybe students and professors still have a a lot in common, you know, so you don't have to reinvent yourself every Monday. <laughs> Question for you. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 <laughs> no. I, I, I think I, I agree with the, the almost all of the remarks, and and, uh, but I, I think that there is something that is it's very. Uh, Singular about uh, the, the the very subject of again the, the ethical condition or the moralistic condition and the, the practice and the differences and so on. Uh, but I think that it's it's very interesting to see that generally you don't define what you do by by uh, by, by the the, uh, the exceptional. So for example, I wouldn't say that any of you is a good person because you go. And you are a good citizen because you walk in the street and you don't kill anybody. That's like that's a given. Okay, you are good because you don't do that. So you don't have to to. And and, and I think that there is something similar with the, the notion of, of being responsible, for example, or what you said, and that's the question uh, of being uh, architecture is because of its, its its context. I think that they are a kind of given. They are so obvious that I. I I think that either it is something that we are losing, and that's why it's so uh, uh, interesting, or, or, or that is so uh, now apparently so visible, or so so weird to talk about that. That architecture belongs to a context, which is for me it's very obvious. Or the fact that you have to be, be responsible or, or ethical in your work, which is for me very obvious. Like you, we, we shouldn't be talking about that. Uh, so I, I think it's it's very in interesting that either we're losing that or we're confirming that architecture is a form of tautology or is a rhetorical art that is basically based on repeating something that is so obvious that it's a tautology. It's it's fitting by by its own rules, and in that sense, I'm I'm, I'm still trying to to uh, understand the deep understanding of architecture by Rodrigo. And that image is very, very important. I, 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 like the fact that there is one hand pointing out, pointing up, which is this kind of statement, isolated statement, but there is the weight of nature. 
it's a kind of a, a, a given fact that that's a responsibility to take care of that that weight. I think it's a it's a balance. That's double image. It's it's a, it's a kind of double condition of the practice of architecture. This leading or or service activity, which is again a sort of circle that it closes to in itself. Well, uh, since you uh, directed your uh, statement at me as well, uh, I, I would like to just reiterate that the context is also a larger context. It's not just the physical context, it's the political cultural context. And so if if we can go on pretending that, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> as, in, as is the practice in some countries to knock down buildings and to replace them by new ones because these buildings that are 30 years old are no longer adaptable, you know, for the use of as offices or apartments. <coughs> if we pretend that we can continue the production of uh, buildings the way that we have done in the last 50 or 100 years, then I think we're mistaken. So that's context number one, uh, uh, to say sustainability is an important issue, and that it changes the nature of our practices. Number one, uh, if we don't address uh, the issue of social inequality, then I think, you know, of course, we as architects, we respond to commissions. And if somebody comes along and says, will you design a 2,000 square meter villa uh, in the countryside, I would say 99% of architects would say yes, right? So, um, <clears throat> and so on. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, well, you know, I'm, 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 just, I'm just saying that this is the condition and I don't exclude myself, or we, I don't exclude us from this. So I'm not holier than thou. Uh, though, what I'm saying is that uh, what are the conditions uh, that propel us to do certain kinds of uh, work. And uh, so the, the notion of context is much wider than just the physical or the, the kind of environmental uh, context. And that is kind of a memory or kind of a, a yeah, uh, uh, trying to say, uh, let's try and uh, situate ourselves in our practices within that. And, um, <coughs> since I have the microphone. Uh, <laughs> I also want to respond to Dean's... I also want to <laughs> respond to Dean's uh, comment. We can take it away if you want to. <laughs> and uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, not quite right to say that these things are very similar. I think they're quite differentiated. And, um, if we look at uh, the house, the vacation house that <clears throat> Betsy presented yesterday, it's fundamentally different, even though it's modernist in its kind of external language, to uh, the house that uh, uh, Pachi, uh, Francisco, and uh, um, Sonia are doing because um, their house is exfoliated, so to speak, right? And it's therefore it sort of exudes its freedom of, of the climatic uh, condition. Whereas uh, the Canadian situation is one of, you know, you have to pack and close, and, and any kind of overhang and uh, so on is a major headache in terms of insulation, uh, right? And so uh, Joshua is also in, in a more uh, ad advantageous climate where you can have all these layers and relatively thin uh, wall constructions. You're not, you're not sort of uh, compelled to do the uh, wrapping that uh, we in the kind of northern hemisphere so to talk about honesty, and this is another moral issue, honesty of construction, which I heard you speak about and which I heard uh, Francisco speak about, um, is still a question that conditions construction. And if that is taken seriously, and if we don't fetishize things too much, which uh, Fernanda is warning us against, then uh, the question is, well, how do you use materials in a in an efficient, economic, but also poetic way. Uh, and uh, it, if it leads to a certain kind of language, I don't have any problems with that. My utopia is not uh, yours, uh, Joshua, well, not 
maybe it's not your utopia, it's kind of a forecasting that we're suggesting that new technologies and new materials will generate new styles, which is the kind of 1880s modernist view. But my utopia is where the, the most amazing piece of architecture would be one where you don't notice anything. You just enter and it's just the perfect place. I think uh, um, following on that, first of all, I, I really enjoyed this afternoon as well as as yesterday, and I was uh, very taken by um, two comments in in, uh, in the expositors today. One of them was the idea of repository, the idea that architecture in the city is uh, it's a place where time uh, finds intersections of all kinds, and this is a fascinating reality, especially in a in a world today where everything is so immediate that nothing really intersects uh, precise meanings. We live in a world, as Joshua put it very well, completely saturated and dominated by the visual. And architects have been the most guilty in that regard to surrender completely to only one sense, when in fact architecture is populated and is released by all the senses and even those things that we cannot imagine. I was very taken when, when Fernanda was showing us this house that suddenly she used a video that was exquisite in the way that it communicated the pleasure of this building that many of us might not visit. So that architecture relies not in the technique of its uh, exhibitionism, but actually in this pleasure that we could hear momentarily, the pleasure of that building. Or the amazing drawings that Rodrigo showed us today that were so intensely physical, you could sense the urgency of the urbanist, the architect, the dreamer, the visionary, searching for architecture at all intersections. And we also use the visual sometimes to imagine a future that will never exist, because sadly, nothing ages faster than the vision of the future. And what we always encounter in architecture is this ever presence that our senses communicate, and our historians might be able to write in their own awkward and visual senses. Thank you. Uh, thank you all to all the speakers for coming and, and presenting to us. It was a wonderful opportunity. I'm a first year student in architecture, um, and so all of this is very new to me. Um, I actually just have a question for the panel. I, I feel like that's part of what we're doing here. Um, for me, for me, latitudes is is about. My understanding of it is is kind of this question about, is there uh, is there an identity of architecture between north and south versus east and west, or versus west and west? If you look at the U.S. and Europe, for example, um, and I don't know the answer. I, I I'm curious to hear the panel's uh, discussion about that. Have you noticed, you know, something that's common? Uh, with across the different projects and across the work. Coleman talked about this idea of authenticity uh, in the context of place. Um, and so is it that you can only have this identity or authenticity that is just so specific to place that you can't have it across North and South America? Or uh, are we seeing something that is, that is actually in common between, between the continents that we can start to share uh, and collaborate together? No, I just want to say I, I think it is an interesting question. Uh, to me, latitudes uh, is like a jigsaw, which assumes that America stands for something which has got some distinctive uh, presence, let's say, from, from other continents. Uh, but it is a very open hypothesis, and we're talking also about vast universes like uh, United States or Paraguay or wherever. Um, but it is a jigsaw which expands. Um, uh, to me, what, what, what was fascinating was to see how one understands uh, something about Ecuador or the United States or Mexico 
or Paraguay through the action of someone who's engaged with the project. So before asking myself whether it's an identity, a common identity to those projects, uh, I think the construction of Jigsaw is, is already uh, rewarding, interesting, and mm -hmm. quite unusual, actually. I've never been to uh, a conference which was organized under that kind of assumption, geographic, cultural assumption. I myself think that maybe there are other topics, like one could think, for example, one could call for latitudes, which talked about the presence of the north and the south, and the reverse perhaps too, you know, transactions. I mean, mm. cities in Latin America now, in the case of Santiago, for example, the, the, the North American influence and the past of growth of Santiago, even the consumer habits, is very strong over the last years, very, very strong. So that we're building up now the model of an American suburbia, which was probably built here 15 years before. The same goes for highways and for other things. So I, 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 instead of framing the question around the subject of identity, I prefer to look at myself, to look at the proposition of that. Firstly, as a very kind of interesting one. Um, secondly, as an occasion to expose things within that framework, that's to have the presence of north, center, and south simultaneously. Um, and then maybe to begin to ponder and to, and to compare that um, one could expand latitudes onto the realm of architectural history, urban history, landscape history, for example, as much as many other kind of subjects. Um, but the, the very exposure of the project within the framework, I think, is already quite uh, valuable. Anybody else wants to respond to the Marco, yes. I, I, I think the, 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 uh, what both Americas have in common is uh, roughly the period during which they were developed, both as uh, colonial reactions to Europe. I mean, I, I don't think questions of authenticity bar bother European architects very much. I don't think they have any sort of anxiety about the things they might have displaced or lands that might not, um, you know, they, when they look to history, they see three, four, five, you know, 3,000 years back to Greece and they feel, I think, totally legit legitimated uh, and uh, urbanized. And I think that they're comfortable in the patterns that they've developed. I think America, both North and South America, have been uh, uh, countries of pioneering, of uh, converting raw land, of settlement, uh, perhaps a certain guilt, as, uh, as there was in South Africa where I was raised, at uh, you know, the taking of land. Uh, and, and, uh, and so the search or the, the, the bother with the thought of authenticity, uh, do I really deserve to be here? Is this really, is this OK? Uh, can I live here? Uh, on this, on this part of the earth, and should I do that as I did when you know the families descended from Europe? What about the people that were already here? Just the image that's on the that's on this, this screen right now, and I think the theme of many of us um, is to search for legitimacy. And I think that uh, North American architects who uh, this North American culture, which is so on the on the on the edge of uh, living by the internet and living by Hollywood and living by extreme commercialism and consumerism, uh, I think this group finds it tragic to see the rest of the world happily following suit. And I think that our motivation is um, don't give up what you've got or don't give up what we once had too, uh, which is uh, sense of authenticity about reason. I think that's what drives a lot of my interest in this. Yes. I feel compelled to speak since everyone around me has spoken. But um, I, I mean, I don't know if anybody wants to respond to Michael's thought about authenticity. Different take on it than, than I have. 
I, I wanted to ask, I want to phrase this as a question. And I think it would be something like, what is it in your mind about the, your practices that goes beyond latency? Like, let, let, let me explain that. I am, um, I'm certainly one to feel like the, a, a large part of what an architect does is to to discern and nurture latent qualities of a particular place or program that are not yet on the surface but could be compelling. Like I think, and and it was very clear in all of the presentations how you all did that. But I, I feel like if that's of a place or a program, whatever. The, the, but but. To me, that gives up a great deal of control for, um, from the creative process, from the architect's role, to just what's happened around it. It's a kind of version of contextualism. It's like just because it's there, or because it might be there, that's the thing to do. And it seemed to me that, that the fundamental contributions that make many of the projects so special actually go beyond just latent issues. Like on, on the two ends of the scale, like on Rodrigo's, that, that I mean, okay, there had been a sense of emptiness in that that place, but the contribution of a of emptiness and then density of foliage, I mean, it seems like it contributed quite an extraordinary thing to the culture, the physical and 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 social culture of contemporary Santiago, uh, Santiago de Chile. Uh, or on the other hand, even the crafting on the other scale of those amazing banquettes that that presumably make the, the social occasion of dining there that much better is a contribution that doesn't come out of just the kind of latent aspects of the program. I, mean, I, I was talking last night about um, this amazing thing that Tom Ford said, the fashion designer, when, when he came to give a talk many years ago. In a, in a panel like this, and he was drinking from a water bottle, not unlike those, and he was being very critical of me, I think, because I had given him that water bottle, and someone asked him a question about, like, why is it fashion? And he said, well, like, I, I can drink water out of a bottle like this, but I can also, I prefer crystal. Like, it makes the act that much more pleasurable. And, and I feel like, in many ways, I want to I want to put this back into a question, like, in your own mind, like, beyond what's just latent in a place or in a program, like, like, well, what, what is there? I mean, I'll answer that softball. <laughs> only, <laughs> only for me because we actually lectured on, we, we actually had a lecture called latency. <laughs> so the whole, it really, it strikes home to our practice. I don't think there's anything powerless about extracting the latent potential of anything. In fact, what it I feel like what it does is you're just you you're paying attention to all the potential ingredients that are right there in front of you. And um, I'll back up and, and explain why this idea of latency even struck me. I was I was listening to NPR about 15 years ago, 14 years ago, and I was um, in my bedroom, and I heard this song, for the, and this is the only time this has ever happened in my life, and it was a concerto, and I'm not even a classical music, I'm completely illiterate in classical music, um, but it made me cry, and I listened to the interview of the creator, which came on a couple minutes later, and he spoke so beautifully about this idea that this song already existed, that he created. He just had to figure out how to extract it from existence, into existence. And it was a very interesting, I mean, it's, it's what's driven our practice. But it, it's a very powerful, powerful place to be, to take a step back, listen, Pull because it's a it's a ground it's it, as opposed to pulling it out of thin air, you're pulling your ingredients out of the meaning of what's right around you. So it immediately grounds whatever act you do. But there's a transformative act of, of what everyone's been 
showing today about hope. So it's taking those ingredients and creating true magic out of them. That's a very hopeful act, and it's, un it's limitless in its potential. So it's, n it's not a powerless act, the act of extracting latency. Just to speak, because we were <laughs> speaking. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. No, in in uh, in Paraguay we have like a, a lack of um, uh, how do you say um, theory. Uh, we we do much uh, uh, like we're very in, in intuitive in the in the things we do and and and. We like to experiment materials. We like to go on on that side, and um, I don't know. Maybe some things we do, uh, uh, like we take some things about mo modernism that that uh, that I think that work, and I don't I don't know. I think that those things uh, work now, and and they can be applicable, and they can be uh, twisted and changed a little bit to solve. Problems from today. I, I, I don't. I haven't seen a, a, I don't know, a newer uh, movement or something that it makes me want to change or makes me want to do something different. I, I'm just not convinced of the, the new things. Don't be natural. But we're. Um, uh, as, uh, as I said first, uh, we 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 really uh, work like on on uh, doing things and not uh, not having fear of of, of doing bad things. Uh, at contra at contrary of that, learning from from mistakes and and that's like a kind of trail we 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 do there in in Paraguay and and. We'll start constructing a, a theoretical part of it that I think we lack. It's, it's a, a bad thing that, but in a way we have other but things. I don't think you need to make any uh, excuses uh, for a lack of theory because um, if, uh, as I believe, architecture is a form of knowledge, mm -hmm. it's a discourse, and you just said that you haven't seen anything that convinces you to do anything else, you read architecture, you reflect on architecture, you use the elements of architecture to construct uh, a mode of communication and a body of knowledge. So that is theory, it is built theory. It yeah. is, you don't have to talk about it like we do here, right? <laughs> uh, all the time. I mean, we get paid for it. Uh, but, uh, you don't get paid for it as an extra, in, as, a, as an architect. But you are just as theoretical an architect anybody else is in this room. So I think you should be quite uh, satisfied and quite calm uh, that, you know, uh, you, are as, you are part of the discourse in the same way as everybody else is. No, I, I, it's, it's a calm thing. It's not, it's just uh, saying that uh, uh, we, we lack, a, 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 maybe we theorize many things, but uh, and speak in a, in, a, in a profound conversation. We, instead of that, we're doing stuff. <laughs> but I, I think that is the, actually the sense of uh, authenticity and legitimacy. And it has to do with how you transform the, the latent uh, things, uh, the common things, just into useful or significant uh, solutions. It's just that. <laughs> Any other questions? I think I will invite Professor Michael Benedict, Halbort's chair in urbanism, to make his final remarks and close this remarkable conference. Uh, 
um, I started the conference uh, making making notes about what I'm going to say to each one of you, um, but I'm not going to do that at all. Um, I, I think the uh, it's been wonderful for me to see uh, latitudes as an idea, sort of rolled over and thought about. Um, it's almost it's gotten sort of bigger in the hands of my colleagues than in what I ever thought it would do. Um, and it seems to uh, unearth um, uh, more and more uh, thought. Uh, and I do think it will probably go on for some time yet as, uh, as the Americas. Uh, and I do think that is a something. Um, sort of keep of this conversation. Um, <clears throat> interesting. My, I do have concluding remarks. And I don't think and rather than it being about uh, the work, I thought maybe it could be about uh, this kind of event. And uh, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Kevin's toast last night to those of you who have taken uh, two days plus travel on each side, or three days, four days, um, out of your lives to sort of be here uh, and uh, have this conversation. Uh, and it. Those of you who, who know me know that I'm actually quite frustrated with the limits of theory in architecture. I do think that there's a limit to how many times we can use the same concepts in various permutations and try to squeeze a little more lemon juice out of them. Um, I, I think architectural theory has become extremely hermetic uh, around very, very tired ideas of function, problem solving, context, as though those words were like settled. Um, and I'm, I'm very anxious to uh, try to uh, make architectural theory uh, reach into other people's theory, possibly. Uh, music, or art, uh, engineering, linguistics, I don't care. Uh, but I, I think we're beginning to chase our tails a little bit in terms of the, our vocabulary is still extremely limited. Um, and I think there's only so much you can get out of running and back. Just, just pure combinatorics. Um, some of you also might know that I spent inordinate amounts of time invading uh, uh, economic theory. It seems to me that the, like the, the gorilla or the elephant in the room is the issue of livelihood, of the anxieties we all have about livelihood. Um, and the fact that the system we work in is, an econ is largely an economic system. And I don't just mean the cost of construction. I mean the way we've configured our profession, the way we get paid, uh, the financial models we use, uh, who has power by virtue of money and ownership, the kinds of things that Wilfred is talking about as our context, I think, is changing. And so my concluding remarks would just be about a tiny aspect of that. And it is the um, idea of productivity. I don't know about um, other uh, South American countries, but here we're sort of obsessed with uh, statistics. And every few months, we hear about American productivity, which is supposed to go up all the time. And it has actually gone up. What is productivity? Productivity is you know, the capitalist's sweetest measurement because it's how much you can get out of your workers. And it's how much you can get out of your land. And it's how much you can get out of your capital and the money you've put in the bank. It's measured in uh, either two units, output per hour, or output per dollar spent in salary. And the holy grail is to increase productivity. Um, and it's not just an economic uh, it's, not, it's also allied to the engineering ideal of efficiency, which is a ratio of output to input. And the holy grail, the search, is for continual um, increase in efficiency and productivity. So we get it in business. We get it in GDP. We get it uh, even now with our students. Uh, the students that are not here now are actually out there being productive. I don't think they're drinking or carousing, um, or, 
I think they are under tremendous pressure to be productive. Um, I know that as a faculty member, uh, we, you, you will know this, we judge each other. And every year we do annual reports. And on that annual report, you list the things you produced. The books you did, the symposiums you did, the things that you put out. It is all output. I've often thought it would be a great idea if on your annual report you should list the things you absorbed, the things that you were receptive to, the books you read, the places you went, the things you've seen, uh, the thoughts you've thought, the people you've met, uh, <laughs> the wine you've drunk, whatever. <laughs> um, I think there are quote unquote productive ways to be receptive. And we're living in a world in which productivity is outpacing receptivity. Everyone is producing, no one is listening. Everyone is writing, no one is reading. The books we produce are beautiful, beautiful centers. I, don't, I, don't, I doubt that more than 20 people have read those books. But I think 2,000 maybe have done this. Just leaf through it. I think the internet has made us exactly the same. We have a, sh a huge shortage of time. We are driven to produce for each other, but we are actually not um, receiving. We are not receptive uh, to each other. The, um, and the implications are tremendous. It has created a society of waste, glut, surplus of everything, of food we throw out, of too many clothes in our closet of choices we can barely make uh, at the speed we need to. It, is, um, it has caused unemployment. We are desperate to find out what we can do for each other. An economy is a gigantic system of people doing things for each other. But if we're all doing things for each other, you need someone who actually appreciates what you're doing. But if you're too busy producing, you can't receive you cannot sort of accept. So it's, we're living in a sort of a world that's out of balance, and the temperature is going up all the time. And the lack of, and there's a lack of time. Uh, and that's something we all feel, and our little phones and our computers have not made that possible. And I think that a lot of what we value uh, when we put up slides of architecture is a sort of a dream. And that dream is the dream of the flaneur, the dream of having time. We look at empty chairs and wish we were sitting in them, but sorry, got to go. Um, and we continually make settings of uh, uh, where we would absorb you know, the beauty we have made. And I don't think we do. And I don't think anyone does. And so we can keep producing architecture, but if people uh, can't see it, they won't buy it. They just won't. Um, so uh, I, I can go on for, on this, but I think let me just conclude by saying this. Perhaps the most valuable part of uh, events like this is that for these couple of days, I think we have been receptive. And we have listened to each other, and we have looked at each other's work. I know that in other arts, in theater, uh, it, okay, let me just say, notice something. I think if you go back to any movement in art, in music or in art or in literature and possibly in architecture, they started with circles. They started with a group of people who made a contract with each other to produce for each other and to listen to each other and to take turns, uh, to take turns at speaking, reading their writing, uh, going to each other's plays, watching each other. And these tight circles generate uh, theory, and they generate because they're a small evolutionary hothouse of people who care to be receptive to each other and productive by turns for each other. That pattern is something we would dream of in a larger society that where we could produce sophisticated architectures 
in which people would be receptive and therefore pay, and then a whole in economy would develop from that. In fact, economics doesn't really care which way around it goes. We could reach a point where, for example, you pay to work. You pay. You don't get a salary. You actually pay to do meaningful work, and you are paid to consume. You are paid to appreciate. So you go to a concert. Say, I'll go to your concert. How much are you going to pay me? Which, it sounds crazy, but actually the entire system could run backwards. It's kind of like you know physics, the laws of physics, where you run no no law would be broken, so the money would just go backwards. Um, so, <laughs> so clearly, uh, what we need is a world that's more balanced between the ability and the connoisseurship and the knowledge to appreciate the great work that other people do. And if you, you know, without connoisseurship, there's no use for expertise. Without expertise, you can have expertise and no connoisseurship. It's a broken circuit. Um, I hope this series starts creating circles. Circles of people that care what the other is doing and that care to impress each other. Um, circles of receptivity would be equal for productivity. So I'm just going to close with that and say thank you very, very much for coming. And thank you all for staying.